Hi everyone, my name is Aya and I'll be doing the reading for us today. So the reading will be taken from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 3. So Nehemiah chapter 3, it says, Eliashib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zachar, son of Imri, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanea. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakoz, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshulam, son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezebel, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Benea, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. The Deshana gate was repaired by Joeda, son of Pasea, and Meshalem, son of Bezodea. They laid its beams and put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. Next to them, repairs were made by men from Gibeon and Mizpah, Mel Melatia of Gibeon and Jaden of Merinoth, places under the authority of the governor of Trans-Euphrates. Uziel, son of Hahai, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next sections. And Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Raphael, son of Hur, ruler of a half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. Adjoining this, Judea, son of Haramath, made repairs opposite his house. And Hashtush, son of Kazhebaniah, made repairs next to him. Malkajah, son of Harim, and Hashab, son of Pahath Moab, repaired another section and the towers of the ovens. Shalem, son of Haloesh, ruler of a half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. The valley gate was repaired by Hanan and the residents of Zenoa. They built it and put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. They also repaired a thousand cu cubits of the wall as far as the dung gate. The dung gate was repaired by Malkajah, son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakaram. He rebuilt it and put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. <laughs> I am so glad you read that, not me. <laughs> Should we do a ministry time? Oh, wow. So we're in a series going through uh, the book of Nehemiah, and our central theme is all about restoring and rebuilding. Um, the idea behind this is that we want to see God restore and rebuild us, the church, this has been a very, very challenging few years, and we're, we're asking, God, how can we build differently going into the future? We also want to uh, see God do some restoration and rebuilding in our communities. We see that our city uh, is like rubble. It is broken and is in desperate need of the gospel and Jesus Christ. And as we uh, look at these things, we're also thinking about how do we build into future church? What will the future church look like um, in the cultural moment that we find ourselves in? And today in chapter three, I want to focus on the builders themselves. What kind of builder do we need to be? What facets is Christ looking for in his church, in us, his builders? Now, of course, the Bible says, unless the Lord 
builds the house, we labor in vain. But we want to sit under that umbrella that God does build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. But sitting under that umbrella, um, what are the characteristics that he is looking for? How can we play our part in being quality builders in terms of God's uh, master plan? And there are some key things that we can pull out of this text which help us to see God as you rebuild. What are you looking for? So here we are in chapter 3. And um, the first thing to know is that this looks like the kind of chapter we all skip over, right? How many of you have done your Bible in one year and you come to something like this and said, oh, you know, we'll just get a day off and we'll just slip into Thursday and get in some real stuff and we just, uh, we just skip over this particular chapter. It's essentially 32 verses of the various gates and the walls and the builders building them. But you've got to ask yourself the question, God, why did you even put this in here? Okay, it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, encouraging, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So every single word, every letter, every verse, chapter in the Bible is God-breathed. And so we're like, God, what do you want to say to us out of chapter 3? And uh, I believe there are amazing reasons. In fact, we could do a whole series just on this chapter of the reasons why God has put it in here. The first thing is this, hidden heroes. He elevates hidden heroes. Note the names. Now, we'll all be familiar, won't we, with the name of Jesus and Abraham and Moses and Daniel and Paul and Peter. But you start hearing and reading words and names, Merimoth and Zadok and Malkajar. And I think there's some great names for anyone who's having babies <laughs> right now. <laughs> Jenny, I wish we'd looked at this chapter before going for George, but anyway, <laughs> good royal name. Friends, this isn't a dull recital of forgotten names. They preserve the story of heroic people who are playing their part in building for the future. Unfamiliar names, unrecognizable names, yet in the story, significant names and significant people. They are hidden heroes. And sadly, the Christian world, not unlike the world we live in, has often elevated, I believe, the names of people over and above the names of Christ and the name of Christ. The Apostle Paul was very aware of this. In 2 Corinthians 12, he talks about, I, I will never boast in myself. I will boast in Christ and Christ alone. And he, this guy's a great guy. He's an apostle. I will not boast in myself. I will not boast in my accomplishments. I will only boast in two things. I will boast in Christ and I will boast in my weaknesses. I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. Paul embraced weakness so to keep him from boasting and pride. Now these builders were everyday, ordinary folk who served an extraordinary task. And we too, aren't we? We're just ordinary people, ordinary folk doing life, but we know that we've been saved and rescued and redeemed by the work of Christ on the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection, and we receive Christ through repentance and faith for an extraordinary task. So it's all about Christ. By grace alone, we have been adopted into his family. We are the redeemed, and we've been saved for good works. As Paul uh, writes to the church in Ephesus, we are created in Christ for good works to do. I've seen, sadly, and particularly over the last few years, too many Christians, particularly leaders, using their God-given platforms, and yet they, their names and the name of Christ and the church has been tarnished because their name 
was seen as more important than the name of Jesus. How many churches do we know that have been built on one person's ministry and on one person's name and only for that person to have a moral failure or caught in financial scandal and then the church is divided, the church is broken and its influence begins to diminish. They have traded character and humility for reputation and false identity. We must be reminded as Christians, I know this isn't a popular message, but in John 15, it says that the world will hate us. As Christians, the world will hate us. It's almost to be seen, um, as tough as that is, as a badge of honor. And as hard as it is, we should not be surprised. So church, we are ordinary people who have an opportunity to be involved in extraordinary kingdom work, following an extraordinary God. What mercy, what grace, what an honor, what a privilege to be involved in that. So friends, you at you work, as a parent, as a student, you are known by God, and that's the most important thing in life. You may not be known by other people. And I often think about who will be known in heaven right now. And I think about someone saying Afghanistan. I think it's so, so awesome that Sam's coming to share with us tonight. But I think about someone just saying Afghanistan right now who is leading a few people to Christ in persecution, in turmoil, in hardship that we can't even imagine what it's like. Meeting secretly in their home every week, studying the Bible, praying together. That person will never be known by you and I and most of the world, but they are known by Christ. And they are celebrated right now by Christ and heaven. He knows their name. And I believe, if we're talking about what the future church, and this is why this chapter is so Important. I believe the future church will consist of an army of the nameless and the faceless. It won't be built around one person's ministry. It won't be built around one person filling out stadiums. I believe it is all of us playing our part, ordinary folk, doing life, washing the feet of our city, marry, marrying well, raising our kids well, handling our finances well, sharing the gospel with people, being faithful, having integrity, day in, day out. And that is how I believe Christ wants us to live for him, to go about quietly with our, about our business for the sake and the audience of him and his fame and his renown. Secondly, this chapter tells me that everyone gets to play. Everyone gets to do their bit. Know that everyone was playing their part. Everyone was doing their little bit of the building. Everyone was doing their bit of building the gate or the wall. It wasn't just a few. It was for everyone. It wasn't, it wasn't just for a few. It was for everyone. Uh, John Wimbo started the, the vineyard movement many years ago. He was seeing amazing things happen. Amazing kingdom breakthroughs, signs and wonders and many people would come and listen. They'd pack out the churches to listen to this one person. He'd lead the meeting. Then he'd get on his piano and lead worship with his songs. And then he'd preach. And then he'd do the ministry time. And John said one day to his wife, Carol, I can either get a tent, have a huge revival, and do this myself, or I can release it to the people and equip them to play. So actually, our inheritance as a church family all around the world is that we don't believe in just the chosen few getting to do the Jesus stuff. We believe that the Great Commission empowered the Holy Spirit coming upon all flesh is for everyone, every single person. And it's about putting ministry into the hands of the people once again. I don't know if you found this, but in Christian circles, so often church is a spectator sport. We're often like in a football match, in the stadiums, enjoying it, maybe paid our ticket, 
watching people play the game, but actually we're not on the pitch playing the game. And we have this perspective and narrative that the Jesus stuff is just for the few. Maybe it's for those in professional ministry. Hey, John, you know, it's, it's really for you. You just get to do the Jesus stuff because you're paid to do it. And you're a professional minister. Or maybe we think it's for those who seem to have it all together. Or maybe it's for those who we see as like they're, they're the holy ones. They, they've got it all sorted. They appear from a distance like, yeah, they're, they're, they're right. They're holy. They're perfect. I often liken it to this analogy of, um, okay, I'm not, I'm not the strongest guy. Okay, that's a confession. And so often when uh, we're carrying something, maybe a table, and there's a few of us carrying a table, and I put my hands to help, the reality is if I let go, nothing changes. <laughs> if anything, I'm just in the way. Most of my team say, John, just leave it. Leave it, please. And, um, and often it's like that, is that we have the appearance of carrying the table. Oh, it's just doing a little bit here, doing a little bit there. But the reality is we're not carrying the responsibility, the privilege. We don't seem to have ownership. We're not all playing our part. And so we have this phrase, this axiom, everyone gets to play, which puts language to a deep-seated value of ours as a church that you will stumble upon if you hang around in our church long enough. It's our culture. It's great what we do up here, but this is literally 1% of everything that we do. It's actually what's really important is that when we gather afterwards and we have coffee and we go to someone and say, do you know what, I just was seeing you today and I felt like I've got a word for you. Do you mind if I pray for you? That's fellowship, not just having tea and coffee and talking about Coronation Street. It's actually about engaging with people and seeing kingdom breakthrough where we are. It's happening in the seats right now. God has already been speaking to you this morning prophetically. He's been whispering things in your heart for somebody else. Everybody gets to do the stuff. I think we've something's happened where we've marked Christians as professional Christians. But we want to be a church where every person serves. Every person gets involved. A church that equips people through training for serving others and for life. And I think a big part of that is as we push this vision of home is that we're calling people home. And that's something that we can all get involved with. And it's not just in church, but it's also in people in our community, people we do life with, people we do work with, is we're calling people home to God and home to a church family, home to a community. That is something we can all get involved with. I'd like to take it one step further this morning and say not everyone gets to play, but everyone actually needs to play. The reality is, is that where we're not being part of that, somebody else is missing out. Have you ever thought about church community like that? Again, let's move the idea of attending church and being a spectator, but let's actually think more about, do you know what, if I don't come and engage, somebody somewhere is going to miss out because of my lack of contribution. That's how the gifts of the Holy Spirit work. That's how the fruit of the Holy Spirit works. It's all in the context of community. Again, Paul talks a lot about this in uh, to the church in Corinth about unity and diversity in the body. And he talks about, you know, we've got the hand and the foot and the eye and the ear. And we all need to play our part and not one thing is more important than the other. All of us have our part to play. Not one is less honorable than the other part. They are all equal. We need each other and God does his extraordinary work through ordinary people called the body of Christ. So let me ask you a question. Do you feel right now that you are out of the game, so to speak? Do you feel like you're just a spectator? Do you feel like you're just merely turning up and attending, which is a great start, but it's not all that God has for you? Do you feel like maybe you've gone AWOL? And I want to say to you, I want to call you out of your isolation 
today and say, the church needs you. We need you. We need you to play your unique, distinctive part. And together with all our individual parts, something beautiful happens. We need the eyes and the arms and the ears and the legs. All are equal. All are precious. And the biggest issue isn't, hey, am I good enough? The biggest issue isn't, hey, do I feel anointed by God? It's actually something as simple as just being available. Just be available to be a vessel to be used by God. You feel unqualified, good. You feel inadequate, good. That means there's going to be no room for boasting. You're the perfect person. When people come up to me and say, look, John, I thank you for asking me to do this and that, but I, I kind of feel like really inadequate right now. I say, oh, great. I, said, I knew you'd say that, which is why I chose you. But people come to me and say, you know, I'm, I should be doing the preaching. I'm like, have you ever written a sermon have you ever preached to your teddy bears at home? Have you ever preached just to one person day in, day out for years? Because that's what God looks at. I don't care if I'm preaching or not. For me, it's the greatest honor in all the world, but I'd, I'd preach whether I had a church or not. This is just what I do. And so God is looking for actually a, a sense of weakness, a sense of reliance and dependence upon him, because otherwise it becomes about us. Jesus was deemed, you know, to be unqualified. He wasn't a priest of the tribe of Levi, not a scribe who'd gone through formal study of Scripture to become a rabbi. He was not a Pharisee or an appointed leader or an elder of the people. He was from Nazareth, and of course, what do they say? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's from a poor family, no prestige, no wealth. That is Jesus. And so we can't come to him with excuses that we don't feel qualified enough. We'll never be qualified enough. Only the blood of Jesus makes us qualified. That is it. That is the dividing line. Just read the list of people in the Hebrews Hall of Fame. Were any of them perfect? No. Look back and read their story, but they were known for their courage. And that's what courage is. Courage is I feel the fear, I feel afraid. I feel ill-equipped and unqualified. I've got loads of wounds and scars. I've got loads of dysfunction in my family. But it's as though God takes those things and he uses it. Why? Because he's in the business of redeeming people and him getting the glory. And that's why he likes to use people like that. You know, for Joni and I, we don't want to lead a church where it's so common that you hear about in churches, which is like the 80-20 principle. 20% 20 of the church do the work and the giving and everything. We were, I'm so amazed at our church community that, the, that people are pitching in in amazing ways. My highlight of the whole week, if I'm honest, is that when I'm here, say Monday to Thursday, and just seeing people come in serving the city, serving, doing ministry, and people have given up work. People have said, you know, I'm just going to work four days and sacrifice and do a day to the church. And many people are starting to do that. And I just absolutely love it. People volunteering, people coming in and just playing their part. And nothing's beneath them. And I'm so encouraged by that. I'm like, this is the church I always dreamed of. Is that everybody just coming in, mucking in and playing their part. Our world is in rubble. We have broken people, broken systems. People are looking for hope everywhere. Our communities are being shattered. And as the church, we don't just serve each other, but our actual responsibility is to confess, as we saw in Nehemiah chapter 1, that we're part of the problem, roll our sleeves up and start to rebuild. And we do it with resurrection in mind. Christ has come. The world is being restored and we are partnering with him in resurrection, in hope, in possibility, in new life, in new beginnings. Seeing rubble, yes, but kingdom rule and reign and resurrection life, dreams, hopes, vision coming to life. We must see the damage around us through the lens of resurrection. Do you see that? When you see broken people, do you dismiss them or do you go, do you know what? Resurrection life. Look what they could be. I was speaking in Sunderland last Sunday morning and I met a beautiful couple who um, 
you know, it was in the 70s, and uh, they told me their story. They said, can we share our testimony? They said that, she said, when I was 31, I lost my husband to cancer. And my husband here, we met a couple of years later, he also lost uh, his spouse to ill health. So imagine, in the early 30s, younger than me, both these people had lost their spouses, unfairly, unjustly, but they met each other, they met each other in Spain, and, and they're still in the same church, like 30, 40 years on, in the, in, in, the, in the seats of this church, the same church, faithfully committed to each other, all adopted their own like stepkids and kids, and serving, one of them was serving, um, uh, had been a secretary to a pastor who uh, was one of really the generals of um, the Christian faith, particularly in the 90s. And I was just like overwhelmed listening to them. I'm like, you guys, you're the hidden heroes. You're the hidden heroes of what we're talking about. And your God has brought resurrection life into you and through you. Jenny and I could tell you story after story. Our, our lives are basically a result of, of God's f- grace and redemption, nothing else. We're just, just making Jesus look good through redemption. We don't deserve anything that we have. Yet, through Christ and his cross and his love for us. The third thing is, you see here, is they're better together, aren't they? You see, throughout this chapter, keeps keep saying things 10 times, next to him, next to him, next to him. Jerusalem's new walls are only being built through cooperation and teamwork. And so here we have merchants, perfume makers, goldsmiths, stonemasons, rulers, roofers, temple servants, city security guards, residents from Jericho, the local area, families from all over, builders, artists, cloth sellers, an absolute mishmash of people. What I love about it is everyone's just doing their bit. Everybody mucking in. People were playing out, as it were, out of their usual positions to muck in. Security guards doing some pointing in the brickwork. People from all over. It's like an episode of DIY SOS. Everybody just playing their part, not about getting the glory, not about even necessarily fulfilling their calling or their gifting but actually just mucking in, all hands on deck. Grab a towel, grab a bucket of cement, a brush for the debris. Just everybody play your part. What I love here as well is that the priests at the beginning go first, the leaders, they go first, and that's what leaders do. They always go first, modeling servant leadership. It's time for the church to get rid of the green room. I've just been at a conference this week, and what I loved about it for a couple of days in Leeds is that some of these guys I was meeting were like some of my heroes, the books that I read and stuff that I listen to on podcasts. And I was at the, there's about 40 big tables, and I was at the back, and um, I'm, I'm just listening to, and then there's this guy next to me, and he turns to me, he said, oh, who are you? And so he grabs my name, tag, and we're talking, and I look at him, and I just said, I've seen you on YouTube. I was, my, I was so embarrassing, so awkward. <laughs> I wish I could have that time again. Just been replaying it all week. Um, and this guy's like one of my heroes. He's an amazing preacher, pastor from a huge church in London, Church of England Church in London. What I loved was, and he's running the whole conference. And what I loved is that he's at the back, on a table, mucking in, not in a green room, not hanging out with all the other speakers and leaders, writing notes to all the sessions ferociously. This young lad, he's about 30, doing the first opening preach, and he's there writing notes like that. I just thought, that's someone who I can follow. That's what I'm about. That's the kind of Christian leadership I'm about. And it was like that all week, just conversations just happening, people just part of the room, not separate. And I love that, and this is so important for us as priests, as leaders, is that we model servant leadership. 
You have here people who would have had the equivalent of office jobs and the, they were doing work in the law courts and had huge social and political influence, and yet they were just getting stuck in. However, you see in verse 5, there's this little anomaly, and it says the nobles would not put their shoulders to the work. It's just like God just slipped that in, just to let you know there will always be people who won't contribute. Don't get too disheartened. There will always be people who won't pull their weight. But we've got to focus on everybody else. And so maybe that's my kind of practical question to you as the church. Are there roles that you think are beneath you? Are there roles that we think others should do? Have we made even a role or a position or a title, an idol or an identity? Are we relying on others to give time and finances but not do our bit? What we need to do is recognize that we're in this together, but we're rallying around the gospel. That is why we exist. We're rallying around. What is our central purpose? The gospel and sharing the gospel, worshiping the king, extending the kingdom. It's both and. And then finally, I'm just going to finish with this. I think we see a crucial ingredient of being a, a builder in God's kingdom is someone who endures. Someone who endures. How do we endure in difficult times? First things first is what we've got to do. We've got to put first things first. We've got to make sure that before we're putting the double glazing in upstairs is that we're building the foundations. You've got to have the priorities right if you want to endure. For when the storms come, we've got to make sure that the house of our lives and the house of the church stay strong. First things first, when I was going to this conference this week, uh, I turned to my daughter Elsie, who's four, and I said, will you miss me? And she said, not really. <laughs> I'm a great dad, okay? I said, why? And she said, because I know you're coming back. And when I came back, she ran towards me, embraced me, and said, I missed you. And it's a stunning picture of actually how endurance works. Endurance works by having hope because she had hope and she knew because there's trust that I would come back because we know Christ has come and will come again we endure when we start to look at our feelings we start to look at our circumstances and the state our world is in and maybe we're struggling with stuff personally and we say if that's our anchor for endurance it will never last we need to have an anchor that is much more sure than that. Verse one, they, I love this, they dedicated the gate as soon as it was built. First thing, they dedicated the gate as an act of worship first and before anything else. And that's to remind them and to remind us we don't worship the building, we don't worship the people, we don't worship the work, we don't worship the vision, all the plans, we worship him. So before they even did any other kind of building, they built this gate and they dedicated it to God. And so if we want to be people who endure, we need to be people who put God first. And we recognize that we worship him and we keep him front and center. And that's why in verse 10, you see that their work wasn't shoddy. It talks about people would uh, do repairs opposite their home. So you can imagine you come out of your home and there is some work that you've been working on. And so they were committed to excellence because it mattered. It was part of their environment. It was part of their home because they were serving. It was a reminder they were serving a vision and a purpose and a God bigger than themselves. And we must always do that if we want to endure. So church, will you commit with us to build church that will endure. It will cost. It is a process. It's daily. It involves plan, includes other people we may not have chosen. It has a vision of the end but lives in the moment. It's brick by brick. It's full of sacrifice and inconvenience. There's no instant results. It's hard work. It always considers the unseen foundations as the most important thing. We want to build a church where Jesus truly is the cornerstone, where Jesus is the foundation. 
Will you join with me in a world of plural truth everywhere that we will be vigilant to keeping Christ as the foundation of our church, especially in the times that we live in? A church that treasures always the Bible and truth above everything else. The worship of God with our lives, that treasures the presence of the Holy Spirit a church that takes discipleship and holiness seriously, a church that takes unity and the bonds of peace and love seriously, a church that exists for those that don't know Jesus yet, that takes evangelism, generosity, compassion, mercy, justice, baptism, communion, all these things as sacred and part of our DNA. If we can do that and we can build and build faithfully and focus on first things first, then I have no doubt we will endure. And he who started a good work in us will see it to its completion. Because he is the author, and he is the perfecter, and he is the finisher of our faith. And that is why he was able to persevere. 